Chipotle. There we go. Testing, testing. Where's everybody at? Right here. We get a little bit of rain and scared everybody away or something? Did you announce a test last week? I don't think I said anything about a test. Huh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, let's open up, open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. We're going to continue on through our journey through chapter 1. I had to say that for Christy, and she's not even here. Christy doesn't like when I use the word journey. She's like, it's overused. Me and Pat, Christy and Nicole were talking about it not too long ago. <laughs> so I used it specifically because I knew she wasn't here tonight. She was just getting off work. When, uh, when I got here, she was just getting home, and I was pulling in. <laughs> Building your own journey to the church, yeah, right? On your journey. She's on call for the next five nights. So everybody say a prayer that she doesn't get called in. She'll be really happy. Very happy. Especially five days in a row. All right. Romans chapter 1. We're going to uh, pick up where we left off. We just got through verse 25. So we're going to pick up in verse 26. And I shut it down a few minutes early last week. Because if you remember... I said, as you get to verse 26 and 27, this is something that I don't like to just blow past because it's, it's crucial uh, that we have proper understanding of uh, what he's telling us here uh, in Romans chapters 1 and, verse, and, uh, and, then, and then also, too, when you look at Romans 1, 18 through about 32 or whatever, uh, basically through the end of the chapter, he's dealing with the Gentiles. He's focusing on the Gentiles and Gentile converts to Christianity. When you get to Romans chapter 2 and verse 1 through Romans chapter 3, and I believe it's like verse 8, he's dealing specifically with the Jews. When you get to Romans chapter 3 and verse, uh, say, 9 or 10 through the end of the chapter, he's dealing with all mankind. And so that is how we look to understand. And how do we know that? It's because you have to keep things in context. And when you're reading and you're going through, remember I always tell you guys, and I've said it many times in the past, when you're reading it, make sure you understand who's doing the speaking, who they're speaking to, what they're speaking about. Because it matters, right? Because there's some times where people will take things out of context because they don't understand who they're speaking to, right? Who it actually applies to. And so here in Romans chapter 1, uh, in verse 18 through, like I said, uh, 30, 32, whatever it is, uh, he's dealing with the Gentiles. And so verse 26 and through 27 is a continuation of the thought process that really started uh, back in verse 18 where it said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness uh, and all ungodliness of men who suppress the truth. In unrighteousness, right? So this is where this is a continuing in verse 26 of the thought process that started back in verse 18. So in verse 26 and 27, that's where we'll begin, and it says this. Romans chapter 1. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in his desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. You look at verse 26 and 27, it's, it's crucial that we, that we understand what it's talking about here. These last two, verses, uh, last two verses are speaking about the sinful nature of homo, male and female homosexuality. Verse uh, 26, he's dealing with the women. Verse 27, he's dealing with the men. It's dealing with the same thought process, the same topic, and that's homosexuality. But we need to make sure that when we talk about this, we understand it in proper context. Because we should make a note that the Apostle Paul isn't describing here homosexual, um, he is describing here homosexual acts and practices. That's what he's describing. He's not necessarily uh, describing homosexual inclination. Or homosexual, or the homosexual condition in itself. It's not just the the, the the thought. It's the thought, and then it conceives, gives birth to sin, like James chapter uh, in James that it talks about that, and it brings forth uh, sin. It brings forth death. And so he's talking about the physical acts, not the inclination, not just the thought process of these things. Does that make sense? The thought process isn't in and of itself sinful unless you act upon it. Because there are many faithful Christian men and women who have those thoughts, but they, they refer to themselves, they look at themselves as a eunuch, 
in the sense that I choose to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God's sake. I could choose to have this other relationship if I'm a male with a female or a female with a male, but I don't want that, and so I choose to live for God in the kingdom, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, even talks about that uh, in Romans chapter 7. And so I just wanted to kind of point that out. And so a person, as we, as we look at this, we need to ask ourselves, because you'd be surprised because of all of the false teachings that are in society, how many people don't really understand, Christians who don't understand what the Bible actually teaches in regards to homosexuality. Uh, does the Bible say anything about homosexuality? Does it teach on transgenderism? Uh, can we know these things? And the answer to them is a resounding yes. And God has given us passages of scripture and his holy word that we could turn to to understand what his uh, moral standard is on the subject. There are too many churches who are not willing to talk about these things. Why? Because all of a sudden you're going to bring down uh, hellfire and brimstone from the LGBTQIA community. But truth is truth. And we must not deny the truth. We must not cover it up to placate people's feelings on any given topic. Yes? Well, I thought you raised your hand. Did you? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, but uh, if, if, these, if someone is um, not doing the, the acts, but yet they're allowing their mind to think about it and to dwell on it, and so they haven't physically done anything, they're still... Yep. That's still sinful, right? It's not necessarily sinful in the sense that it's where you allow your thoughts to go, right? If, if I was to look at somebody in the auditorium and I say, wow, you know, Talisa's a really beautiful woman. Is it sinful for me to say that Talisa's a beautiful woman? No. 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 It's just yeah. speaking the truth. Exactly. But if I was to say, man, Talisa's a beautiful woman, and then you take in your mind and you start to go one, two steps further, now all of a sudden, yes, we, that's sin. You could have an attraction for a same sex and not actually have sin until <coughs> sin is then practiced. You then take your lustful thoughts and then you put them into practice. And that's why I said we have to understand here, if you read the verses, verse 26 and 27, and in verse 27 it says, And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman, burned in their desire toward one another, men for men doing what? Committing indecent acts. It was the act of sexual, uh, of a sexual homosexual encounter, of a, of, a, of a sexual nature, right? They were performing homosexual acts. But it wasn't the thought, it was the performance. But doesn't the Bible tell us that um, if men or women think of other men or women... In lustful ways, Jesus says right. to hit, yeah. it is sin. Then. But I just explained it. Okay. Okay. I said, if you're looking at somebody because you're attracted to somebody... I could be attracted to somebody as a, as a married man, and I could say, but I don't act on it. Is it sinful? No, because there's lots of people that you could say are beautiful people. I mean, men and women do it all the time. Me and Christy joke around all the time. Well, you said the key word is minor, right? An adult female or adult male that's having a sexual attraction to a child, that's a pretty different story, pretty different circumstance than uh, two, uh, two adults that may have an attraction but never actually act on it. And so I know these things to be true because let's just go over to James. Yeah, go ahead. Before you go, I think verse 28 is important here because... Yep. What, what it specifically says is if you don't put God first, yep. then he's going to let you be taken over by the yeah. lustful mind. Absolutely. And, and what Jesus was saying that is generally where do murders, adulteries, fornications, where do, these all, where do all these things begin? They start in your internal desires. They start in the mind. Mm -hmm. well, they, right? And then you get to choose on how far you're going to allow your mind to go with these things or you're going to put a stop to it and then pray to God, Father, I need your strength. Please give me your strength. And you know, only you know if your thoughts are going too far, which constitutes sin, and then you pray to the Father. You 
ask for forgiveness, right? And so, Judy, do you have your hand up? I have a cousin that uh, when she was going to college down at Lipscomb, she got, she's never been attracted to men. She was kind of masculine. Yeah. But anyway, she got caught into that world down there. Yep. And she stayed after school. She lived that for 15 years. Yeah. But then the teachings of her youth came back to her. Her father, my uncle, was an elder. And then she realized she had to walk away from it. And she said, yeah. now, I'm not attracted to men. I'll never be with a man. Yeah. But I will not be with a woman and risk going to heaven. Yeah, absolutely. So she battles her inclination. Yeah, exactly. She ignores it. She just exactly. And she chooses to live for God and not for her fleshly desires. Look over to James chapter 1, please. James chapter 1, we'll look at uh, basically starting in verse 13. We'll pick up, I guess. <clears throat> James chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Notice what it says. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, for he himself does not tempt anybody. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The word lust, if you look it up in a dictionary, I know many times we like to put, uh, give lust the connotation of a sexual nature, but the word lust literally just means a strong desire. You could have lust, strong desire for anything and everything. I mean, everybody's different, right? And so, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. What does it mean when lust is conceived? When you act on it. So does that, is what James says in alignment with what I just said a few moments ago. Right? And so it's the function of them, right? And how do I also know this? Because let's go back and let's look at what the scriptures teach. Let's go back all the way to the Old Testament, Leviticus. We're going to see what the scriptures actually have to say about homosexuality. It is so quiet in here. I know. Leviticus 18 and 22. Leviticus chapter 18. We're going to look at two passages, one in chapter 18, one in chapter 20. The first one will be in 18, we'll look at verse 22. And we're going to see what the Bible has to say about homosexuality. And it says this. All there? You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female is an abomination. What is that verse talking about? Is it talking about I can't sleep next to my brother? Because uh, we have, you know, a bunch of people in town for a family event. I can't share a bed with my brother. What is the context? It's a, it's a six, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's the practicing of a sexual uh, event, right? It's sexual in nature when you keep it in context and you look at the whole of the chapter, which they often call the sex chapter, right? So Leviticus 18 and 22 says, you should not lie with a male as one lies with his female. It's abomination. It's talking about sex. Then you looked at Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13 says this. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, talking about sex, both of them have committed a detestable act. They surely shall be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. It's not talking about... Uh, you know, uh, we're up at man camp and uh, we have uh, more people came than what signed up for. And we're out of beds and maybe a couple guys shared a pallet on the floor. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about as one would have sex with a woman if you then turn that and you have the same practice with a man. And you're a man. That's what the scriptures are talking about. Then we flip all the way back to the New Testament back in 1 Corinthians and we're going to look at that as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 through 10. 9 and 10, I should say. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. We're looking at what some of the Bible has to say about these things because I want you to see that in every case, it's the physical act of sex. It's not a thought. It's the physical act, whether it be heterosexual, whether it be homosexual. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators. What's a fornicator? Come on, guys. You should know this. 
two heterosexuals who are having sex. Yeah. It's not two heterosexuals who might like each other. A fornicator are two heterosexuals that are having a sexual relationship. Okay. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers. What's an adulterer? A married person having sex with another married person. Once again, it's a physical react. It's a physical relationship. It's not, you know, two married people. I may like somebody. They may like me, but we never think about it. We never uh, practice it. And the reason why I keep saying it's somebody having sex is because it seems like there was some confusion between the thought and the actual practice and the carrying out of it. So fornicators, adulterers, effeminate. What's the word effeminate mean? It's one who has female quality, a male who has female qualities and further in homosexual relationships, it's the male who takes on the female role. I don't want to be uh, uh, oh, any, more any more explicit, but the point is, I think you, know, you understand what that means. Yeah. Nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So you look at these couple passages in the Old Testament, you look at Romans chapter 1, you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's all talking about the physical acts of sex, whether it be heterosexual sin or whether it be homosexual sin. Both of them will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so homosexuality, it tells us, is an abomination to God. But too many times as Christians, we like to, we like to really zero in on the homosexuals. And yet, there are young couples, Christians, who are shacking up with their boyfriends and girlfriends, but they're such a nice young couple. We, you know, they're, they're maybe a good prospect for maybe becoming a member of the church, and maybe we'll have another young family. Nobody calls them on their sin. Why is there a distinction? Where does God make that distinction? He doesn't. But have you noticed that the church likes to make that distinction? It's Yep. But it's not very uncomfortable for Christians who like to call out homosexuals. I'm just being honest, right? I'm just being honest. Tell me. There's another one that is too easy to call out and bash people for. And the Old Testament, right after and before the verse we were just reading, there was the about the animals. Yeah. That apparently that was an issue back then. Yeah, bestiality. And I'm guilty. I've jumped on the bandwagon like, hey, that's gross, fella. Don't that's I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. Well, you know, they have sin. It's still sin. And there's just as much, hopefully there's not as much, you, you mentioned that there's much uh, heterosexual sin, is, 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 or there's more heterosexual sin, maybe, yeah. than homosexual sin. Yeah. But We're I not going to talk about what uh, wagon you're jumping on or off, but that's a, that's a different study altogether <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the beastie alley. Uh, I'm teasing. But ask yourself this. Why do, you felt, why do you think the Holy Spirit felt that it was necessary to write through, uh, through Moses? About bestiality? Because it, was happening. because it was actually happening. It was He wasn't talking about something that may become a problem in the future. He was writing about it because it was already happening. And you hear about the sick, nasty jokes in the world today when people still are engaged in bestiality. Solomon writes, there's nothing new under the sun. So, does the Bible say anything about transgenderism? Flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5. Remember, we're all adults here. We can have this conversation. I know some people get a little squirrely, but it's okay. God created sex to be a beautiful thing within the confines of a marriage. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5 tells us, a woman, should not wear, a, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the God, to their Lord your God. What is that symbol verse telling us? Dress like a man, dress like a woman, and, and not vice versa. Okay. There's actually another one in Deuteronomy chapter 23 that we won't go to that talks about the mutilation of the genitals and how they are not to be even allowed in the presence of God because people who have then uh, made themselves, have mutilated themselves, and it goes along with Deuteronomy chapter 22. 
So does the Bible talk about transgenderism? Does it talk about homosexuality? Yeah. Does the Bible also talk about heterosexual sin? Go ahead, Leslie. Do eunuchs mutilate themselves? Eunuchs were either born that way, they, they were made that way uh, by themselves, potentially sometimes, and then they were also made that way by kings. Because the kings didn't want the eunuchs uh, uh, messing around with their, uh, what are they called it? Uh, a harem of wives, because most of the kings in those days had many wives. And many of the eunuchs actually took care of those wives and uh, the preparation of clothing and of all different types of things. Well, if they're a eunuch, there's no then worry of something happening. So Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 19. Let's flip over there. You asked the question. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus actually talks about that. In regards to the topic on marriage, let's see what it has to say. Matthew chapter 19, we'll look at verse 12 is where it actually Jesus talks about it. So actually, let's go back to verse 9. Matthew 19, starting verse 9 says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man and his wife is to be like this, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Do not, uh, not all men can accept this statement, but only those uh, whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born that way from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And there are also eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. It gives you three different examples there of how somebody can become a eunuch. We also know today, and not, there's nothing new under the sun. They were doing it back then. Did you know that 12 of the 14 emperors of Rome were homosexual? Yes. Or bisexual? Because they would like to go both ways, right? But we also know that there are people in that day and age as well as in this day and age who mutilate their genitals because they don't longer have a they no longer want to be identified as one, a male, they would rather be identified well now as a female. And so and the and the opposite is true as well. And so you look to the scriptures here and I wanted to point these things out to you because there are too many congregations who are afraid to talk about these things. I don't understand why people are afraid to talk about these things when this is one of the major problems facing our uh, society today. They're starting to teach our children, little children, uh, about all these different things in sex ed classes as early as middle school. Sometimes as earlier than that in different literature. What we don't see, and what doesn't make it on the television news, is these young people and these children that are totally confused mm -hmm. and under pressure from uh, homosexual teachers yeah. and what have you, and, and you don't see the results of these hormonal changes, a girl becoming a boy and a boy becoming a girl, later on, it could be two years, it could be five years, it could mm -hmm. be ten, where they commit suicide, they're totally confused about life and who they are, what they are. Yeah. And the problems that they have continuing yeah. forward, we don't see that. Have you guys noticed in the news, it's uh, very difficult to define what a woman is these days. Yeah. Why? Where does, where does that come from? Because we're not biologists. Because we're not biologists? <laughs> I didn't know you had to be a biologist to define that that's one. That's the big line that the woman gave when she was asked if she was a woman. She said, I'm not a biologist. I don't know. So now in school, they're thinking about switching it to you know, uh, removing the term mother. One of the, uh, the, the leading teacher unions in this country is looking to remove the word mother and replace it with birthing person. Birthing person. Yeah, we're, we're all watching this. It's sad. That's the NEA, the largest teacher. Yeah, NEA. Is it all men? There's a, there has been a liberal progressive. <laughs> yeah. There has been a liberal progressive feminist movement that has been going on for 30 or 40 years. 
These things didn't just happen in the last, these things have been, been being set up for decades now. And now you're starting to see the kind of the fruit that the fruit of the labors that have went into all of this indoctrination for 30, 40, 50 years now. David, actually. Hold on one second. Tyler? I just, I can't help but kind of have a respect to that. The whole thing is a, uh, it's a mockery of God's real, of the, of the real system. Yes. It's a quiet, but it's a, it's a blatant mockery of, I mean, it can't continue, right? Two guys can't make a baby. Yeah. And maybe you don't want a baby, and okay, but I'm saying if everybody turned gay, right. then uh, we wouldn't have been yeah. here. You know, like it's 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 an absolute upside down logic. Somebody, uh, I remember uh, me and my brother, one of my brothers uh, from another congregation, uh, Jerry McKinney, we were sitting talking one day, and and he says, yeah, Dave, he goes, you know, when I was teaching, I, I sat down with one of my teachers, uh, fellow teachers, on a break, and it was lunch, and we we're just sitting there talking. And she knows I'm religious, and she had these questions, and she said, uh, how do you know that God? didn't uh, create him that way when people say God made me this way and so he drew uh, he drew uh, uh, two circles or three circles he says here's three planets each circle represents a planet you have all the lesbians on this planet you have all the homosexual males on this planet and you have the heterosexuals on this planet yeah. which planet's going to survive <laughs> it's not very difficult to do the math on that right there's only one of them that's going to be able to procreate. The other two are going to die out. And so in the beginning, God created them male and female. Is that what it says? What does 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 say? Please turn there. You look over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and you look at verse 16. I want you to see what it says here, because it's so important that we remember what it says there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God, and it's profitable for what? Teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Please flip over to 2 Peter for a second. You get over to 2 Peter, and you see what Peter has to say. 2 Peter. Let me see where it's at. Chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 20 and 21. Or am I in the wrong chapter, maybe? Actually, I think it's 1 Peter. Or, no, actually, I was in 1 Peter. <laughs> 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Okay, I was right. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Why do I mention 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 2 uh, Peter chapter 1 in regards to this conversation? The Bible's right. We're not, we're not making up. We're not Amanda, making you look like you want to say something. Oh. Well, Go ahead, say it. People twist the Bible's words all the time. People twist and the Bible's they words. They use their interpretation. They'll make it look any which way. Yep. But it's also, I mean, people will also find contradictions sometimes. They think. And like they think. Yeah. And which one is it that you feel is a contradiction? Oh, no, I don't. I was just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, but like, that, that can I'll say, I'll help you right now. I mean, I've been there before. I've been yeah. studying and been like, oh. Like, and this is why, and I understand exactly what Amanda was saying, because when I first read the scriptures uh, for myself, and I know I'm not saying you are first reading them, but when I first started to become a Christian and I started to learn for myself, I would read this, I would say, what? Like, that's weird. Like, remember the prostitute that uh, was in... Uh, was in the Pharisee's home and Jesus was there and then uh, she started you know, touching Jesus and, and, and he was thinking, he didn't verbalize him, he said, if Jesus, if this was uh, the son of God, if this was a prophet, he would know the type of woman that's touching him. And I thought to myself, you know, in my 21st century mindset, how does prostitute get in my house? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> some lady in the street walks in, I'm like, hey, what are you doing in my living room? Get out of here. But in those days, to understand the culture, they had an open door policy. So in order to, 
feel important in the Jewish culture, if you were entertaining a, a, a somebody who was of importance, you would leave the door open, people of the village could come in, and it was a way of basically building yourself up. They weren't supposed to interact, certainly not supposed to touch the guest, you know what I mean? And But it was something that was done in that culture as a way to kind of uh, kind of puff your ego up a little bit, right? Go ahead. David, I've, I've had this conversation with many people, and it gets down to the point I ask them a simple question. Does God make mistakes? Yeah. I love that. Ever since you said that, I've been using that from and time to time. And if they believe God makes mistakes, then you go to a study about who God is, what he is. Amen. That he's incapable of making mistakes. Amen. But their concept of God is totally wrong. Yeah. And our problem in this society today, there's too many people that do not accept God, yep. do not believe, say they don't believe in God. Yep. Which I, in the long run, I, my father used to say, there are no atheists in foxholes. Yep. And there are no atheists typically in hospital beds. But eventually, they may come to that knowledge. But if they do believe God makes mistakes, then their concept of God is flawed. Amen. I always remind heterosexuals that we sin too. Let's not get too high and mighty, yep. right? Uh, I've had many uh, Bible studies and different things with homosexuals and had some great conversations with them and trying to teach them what the scriptures teach, that God loves you, and you but you just can't have that relationship. You can have a relationship, you can't have that relationship, right? I know that alcohol may have, alcohol runs in my family, and there's lots of people within my family that are addicted to alcohol. So the, I have the propensity to become an alcoholic if I was to continue on drinking alcohol. And so I choose not to drink alcohol, right? And so I replace it with a different beverage. I know it's not the same, but the point is it's something that's going to lead to sin. Like the relationship would lead to sin, so would probably me continuing going down this road that leads to sin, right? And the drinking of the alcohol. But I look at this because... Uh, the Bible talks about fornication. It talks about adultery. Those are heterosexual sins, right? I mean, I guess adultery technically could be a, a homosexual as well, but, but typically speaking, those are no one thought of as heterosexual sins. So when you look at them, they're all sins, sexual sins. And that's the bottom line. All these things can be forgiven if you repent, right? But at the end of the day, I really firmly believe at the, the, the soul of my being that we often like to judge more harshly those who are of heterosexual or those who are of homosexuality than those are who are of heterosexuality and i know it's because we say well it's just so different it's so foreign it's gross but at the end of the day in god's eyes it all leads to hell if there is not repentance on a grand scale the heterosexuals are going to end up in the same place as the homosexuals yes or no yes. so let's stop you know you know, weighing one heavier than the other and let's teach them both equally about the love of God and that he died for your sins and mine. And while your sins may be different than my sins, their sins are what separates us from God. I don't care what the sin is. And we all need to repent and to turn back to God and to teach everybody with love and gentleness and not trying to be holier than thou when you talk to certain groups of people because you look down upon them for maybe their lifestyle. Does that make sense? They were converted in the Corinthian church, so it is possible. Amen. All right, before we move on, let's go back up to verse 18, though, of Romans chapter 1. So let's get back in Romans. I want to show you something here, because when we get back up to verse 18, in context, right, of these 26 and 27, we go back up to Romans, and we get to uh, chapter 1. We're in verse 18, and I want you to remember who he's talking to here. He's talking to Gentiles. Remember what was happening in Rome. Were there many pagan temples in Rome? And in those pagan temples, were there uh, pagan prostitutes, both men and male and female prostitutes? Absolutely. That was actually a huge part of those pagan uh, religions and belief systems. So you go back up to verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God had made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his divine attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that we are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks because they became futile in their speculations and their foolish hearts was darkened. 
Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Uh, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrade passions for the women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural and in the same way also the men abandon the natural function of the woman and is burned in their desire toward one another men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error why did I go back and read from 18 to 27 there to put it in context it started with a rejection of God of a holy and righteous God. God had made himself known to his creation. We are without excuse. But instead of bowing down and worshiping God, we created our own gods. And when you create your own God, you create your own uh, religious system, your own belief system, right? And so they started to then add anything and everything. But the anything and everything they were adding had to do with the, the desires of the flesh. And they fulfilled their wildest fantasies and desires, and they called it worship. And they made up some image, the, a bronze, a stone, a wood image, and they worshiped them things. And God, because of these things, gave them over to their degrading passions. Do you see now when you hear it all in context, it makes sense. There was a, there was a system of events that were happening, and it all begins with them denying God and what the Bible teaches. Right? They didn't have the Bible per se at that time, right? These letters were coming out, but they denied the God who they, who they can know because he had made himself known to them. Questions or comments before we move on? Yes? It's an interesting book, uh, God's at War. We've got a few copies of it here. Yeah, God's at War, yeah. We're, we're all coming, we're, we're, we're in that same cycle right now. Amen. People, the TV is God to some people. I mean, money. We, we have stopped making stone and wood and marble images, and we replace them with the gods of ourselves and the many, many material things that we've turned into God and that we've actually almost created a form of worship around those things because anything that takes a place of your relationship with God as front and center, anything that pulls you away from serving God first to do something else has now become a god. We call it an idol, but it's the same as a god. What thoughts do you have? Any other thoughts before we go on? Anybody? I'm going to read a verse right along with what you talked yeah, about. Yeah, go ahead. Paul writing to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 4, chapter 2. Well, chapter verse 1 and verse 2, excuse me. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying yep. attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons <clears throat> by means of the of liars, seared in their own conscience, as with a branding iron. That's First Timothy four one through four. One, one and two. One and two. Yeah, that's it's a great passage of scripture to go along as a supplement to this, right? So let's continue on now in Romans chapter one and verse twenty eight. Oh, Leslie. Well, I know this verse is talking about the body of Christ, but it, it always it always it, it puts it into. Which verse are you talking about? First uh, Corinthians twelve eighteen. First Corinthians twelve eighteen. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what it says. And when it's not, you, 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 it doesn't remove the, the aspect of choice. And I know there's a lot of the denominations out there that will teach that it removes the, the free will that we uh, claim that we have, right? And that God had preordained who was going. And they'll go back to like Ephesians chapter 2 and they'll look at other places in Romans and they'll say, oh, it was preordained. No. God knew who would choose him because he knows all things, right? That's how he was able to put a plan of salvation in before there was a planet, before there was a human race, before there was even Adam and Eve. He had put a plan of salvation in place because he had already known what would happen. How these things happen, how he knows these things, I don't know. But at the end of the day, he has this knowledge, right? He's omniscient. But we continue in verse 28, and I know Jim's uh, going to read the five-minute bell, so we have five more minutes. 
Let's look at 28 and following of Romans chapter 1. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Remember, when it says he gave them over, he only just allowed them to do what they were naturally doing anyways, and that was moving further and further and further away from God's righteousness. And it says, gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, they are slanderers, they are haters of God, they are insolent and arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without mercy, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And though they, man, and even although they, meaning mankind, know the ordinances of God, they choose or, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. I'm going to read 32 over because I start stumbling over my words. And though they, meaning mankind, know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also like to give hearty approval to those who practice such things. You look at these verses here. How many people do we know? Or how many people can each of us say that we know in our lives that are full of envy, which is jealousy? You know anybody who's jealous and full of jealousy and has uh, jealous tendencies, right? Do you know anybody who gossips and uh, who's unloving and untrustworthy and unmerciful? Do you know anybody who's disobedient to parents or arrogance or boastful or slanders? Do you know anybody who's sexually immoral or greedy, right? If we know people like this, my advice to you would be after you try to teach them, after you try to mentor them, after you try to influence them with God's standards, if they will not repent, if they will not choose God and they reject God and his moral standards, you need to replace their influence over your life. What do I, need, what do I mean by you need to replace their influence over your life? Say again, sure. Sever the friendship. Sever the relationship. Why is that necessary? Somebody? Thought I heard something? Judy? Yeah, Pam? Just like what you're saying, they're influencing you in some kind They're influence, of right? When you realize, when we realize that, oh, you know, it, they're ungodly. Yeah. So you've to tried them. to reach out to them. Right. You've tried to uh, mentor them. You've tried to influence them. Mm -hmm. You've tried to teach them, and they reject your God. They reject Jesus. Then the Bible says, stop throwing your pearls before the swine, and you might want to remove them from your everyday existence and everyday influence, because 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 says, do not be deceived, bad company will corrupt good morals. You know how that statement is true? How many times have you been around people who you know are not necessarily all that good of people, but you, you know, enjoy their company for one reason or another, and then eventually you start to, start to make excuses, and you start saying, well, they're not that bad. What have you done? You just you're just choosing to overlook right certain uh, character faults because you want that relationship. You desire that relationship, and so now I'm willing to set aside the standard of God, and I know that it might influence me to do some things I might not want to do, but I'm going to allow them into my life anyways because I enjoy their company. Oh man, we're gonna go three minutes over. 2 Corinthians 6. Turn there, and we're going to end it on this verse right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Jim, don't ring the bell yet. There's air conditioning. They'll be fine upstairs and downstairs. 2 Corinthians 6. We're going to look at one more passage of Scripture, and we're going to shut it down after that. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. The Scriptures tell us, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Bilal, meaning Satan? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst. Who's their midst? The sinners. The sinners, right? The, those who, are, who, who, who you have nothing spiritually in common with. Yeah, and so going back to verse 14. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and, daughters, and sons and daughters to me, says Almighty God. 
Brother, and you look at this that passage of Scripture, and it's usually where somebody will say in the audience at this point, but Jesus ate with sinners, Dave? Have you ever heard that? Yeah, he did eat with sinners, but not to offer social acceptance of their sins and their lifestyles. He did it to teach them the truth, to, to try to get them to repent and to turn away from the sin in their lives. When the woman who was caught in adultery came and he says, those who, who is without first stone, uh, cat, go ahead, throw the first stone if you're without sin. And they all went away. He says, did you find nobody condemn you? No, Lord, then I too find fault, not fault in you. But go and sin no longer. Because he, Jesus, knew that they were using her as a pawn in a scheme to get to him. And he wasn't going to allow it. But Jesus didn't meet with the sinners to give social acceptance to their sins. He did it in order to teach them the truth. Teach sinners the truth. Jesus came to, uh, to be with sinners, to get them to repentance. Seek and save the lost. And so we're going to talk more about that, uh, that, uh, that particular set of verses, uh, 2 Corinthians 6 there, starting next week. And let's close it in prayer since we're a couple minutes over. Yes, you have the last word. Okay. So, um, if you could pray for their family. Her name is Pandora. Pandora? Yeah. Okay. The yeah. And he, uh, he was taking out the Eden's friend's dad. Yeah. Okay. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, Father God, and we, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to uh, worship you uh, and, and study your word. And, and I just pray, Father God, that our study uh, was, uh, was beneficial for all of us that were here. I pray that we always make a proper application of your word and that you guide us and lead us through these studies. And Father, we just pray at this time for uh, Eden's, uh, uh, one of Eden's uh, uh, friends in her class, Father, um, uh, her, uh, whose father was having trouble. Uh, Pandora, and we just, just pray, Father God, for, uh, for your comfort on that family during this difficult time. Uh, and we just pray, Father God, that uh, I know uh, Roberta uh, had successful surgery, and we, we thank you, Father, for the answered prayers. We ask that uh, you be with her during her recovery, uh, and so Sister Gaber could uh, come back to us and uh, with her full strength and, 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 and put some of these troubles that she's been having behind her. We know that there are many who are hurting on the prayer list right now, whether it be emotionally, physically, spiritually, even financially, with all the difficult times we're seeing in our country right now. And we just pray, Father, your blessings upon each of these families. Uh, Father, according to your will. Father, we pray for the, the president and, and all the elected officials of this country. Father, while we may not agree with policy positions, we know that you allow elected leaders to be in position. And we just pray, Father God, that you will guide him and the rest of his uh, administration, Father, in your word. Uh, and I pray that they come to the knowledge of the truth of your, uh, of your moral standards and they start to make decisions based on your standard and not man's. Father, we have many people who put their lives on the line, uh, military, uh, uh, police and firefighters, uh, EMTs, uh, that go into uh, very difficult situations, Father, uh, to protect and to serve our communities and our nation. And I just pray a special blessing on each of these men and women's families. And we pray, Father, uh, for them to be able to do their jobs to the best of their ability and to come home safely each and every night to their families. Father God, we love you and we thank you and ask you for all things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone.